drugs. On one hand, America's war on them has been a complete catastrophe, but on the other hand, it did give us this photo of Nancy Reagan sitting on Mr T's lap, <laughs> so it wasn't a complete loss. And by the way, I pity the fool that didn't think they were gonna fuck after that. <laughs> specifically, specifically, we're gonna talk about opioids. And if you're thinking, hold on, didn't you do a show on this before? Yeah, we did one two and a half years ago. But tonight, we're gonna do an update for a couple of key reasons. First, the epidemic is very much ongoing. In 2017, opioid overdoses killed more than 47,000 Americans. And second, since then, we've learned a lot more about many of the companies involved, and some of it's been amazing. For instance, a criminal case involving executives from the drug maker Insys unearthed a rap video allegedly made to motivate their sales force to go out and sell a painkiller containing the highly addicted drug fentanyl. Take a look. My delivery is giving me 38% of this industry plus my availability. I'm built to last. Y'all can't get rid of me. How'd even be sick of me? But attacking me is actually practically just a silly comparing act to me. Y'all sick of me. This ain't no fight at all. And if you're trying to ball, I'll substitute you like it was xylitol. Hi, beast. Yes. Beast. But, but let's just stop for a moment there to unpack the line, if you're trying to ball, I'll substitute you like a xylitol. That is a reference to the key ingredient in sugar-free gum. It is astonishingly, almost impossibly lame. It is genuinely difficult to come up with a rap that is lamer than that, and I'll show you. Splash rules everything around me. Hanks get the mermaid. Daryl, Daryl, Hannah, y'all. Now... <laughs> Is that lame? Is that lame? Yes, it is. Is it lamer than the Insys video? I think it's hard for you to make that case. <laughs> and that rap video was just the tip of the iceberg in terms of new information now coming out through numerous court cases. So tonight, let's pull a few of these new revelations together and look at what we've learned about how the first wave of the opioid crisis began. Because it's a story of how major companies acted wildly irresponsibly, skirted any meaningful consequences, and for the most part, avoided public scrutiny. Let's start with drug distributors. These are the big three. They're the companies responsible for getting drugs uh, to pharmacies and, hos and hospitals. They're supposed to alert authorities if they notice suspicious orders of controlled substances, but for a sense of just how badly they failed to do that, look at Kermit, West Virginia. Named, of course, because it's where Kermit the Frog lives with his secret second family. <laughs> oh, that's right. He's in a throuple with two salamanders named Francois and Gary, and they are very, <laughs> very happy. It was, it was never you, Miss Piggy. It was him. <laughs> The, the amount of opioids sent to Kermit, a town of just 400 people, was utterly ridiculous. This undercover video of Kermit's main pharmacy shows scores of people picking up prescriptions inside and at the drive through window. More than three million doses of hydrocodone were ordered by a Kermit pharmacist, James Woolley, in one year. It's true. Three million doses to a town of 400 people. That's around 7,500 pills for every resident in Kermit. And just to be clear, we mean every resident in Kermit, not every resident in Kermit. Kermit... <laughs> Kermit is a top, I'll have you know. Not that that is any of your business. But those sorts of figures clearly should have caught the attention of distributors. In fact, the largest one, McKesson, alone shipped five million doses of opioids to Kermit in just two years. And that's just one example of McKesson's reckless behaviour. And the problem is, at no point were they effectively deterred. In 2008, the DEA alleged that McKesson had failed to control its controlled substances. McKesson agreed to pay a $13 million fine, that's all, without admitting wrongdoing, and also promised to do better by implementing a controlled substances monitoring programme. But that programme emphatically did not work. In fact, a DEA official later wrote their bad acts had continued and escalated to a level of egregiousness not seen before. Because of course they did. You can't put McKesson in charge of monitoring McKesson. If the bears in your zoo get out at night and start mauling the other animals, you don't deputise one of the bears to monitor the situation. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking, but, John, I've already bought him a little sheriff's outfit to wear, and I think he'd look great in it. And, yes, of course he would, but... At the end of the day, bears are gonna bear. It's just in their nature. And again, before you say, well, I've spent quite a bit of money designing a custom-made sheriff's badge just for him, don't you think the bear will recognise the gravitas of that symbol and feel compelled to grow and change his bear ways in some way? No, I don't, because bears respect nothing. They, they think the importance that we place on symbols and status makes us weak. They value nothing but blood and strength. And I know what you're gonna say now. Is there anything I can do? The answer is, of course not, cos while you were talking, Sheriff Bear mauled you to death. You're dead now. Goodbye. Why, why are we still talking about this? <laughs> the point is, McKesson monitoring itself 
clearly did not work because in 2017 they wound up agreeing to another fine, bigger this time, $150 million this time, which, yes, sounds like a lot, until you realise that that is less than one one-thousandth of their revenue for one year. And while, while today McKesson says that they've improved their monitoring systems, for realsies this time, <laughs> pinky promise! <laughs> And, and they argue that they weren't the ones uh, setting the demand for opioids uh, at, at any point. Even the DEA agent in charge of their case thought that their settlement was absurd. How do you settle? How do you say it's okay? Just, here, write this check this time and, and close this place for a little bit. Sign this piece of paper. How do you do that? No. Put him in jail. He's right. Put him in jail! <laughs> and, and honestly, I'd watch an entire show that is just that guy telling me where to put things. <laughs> McKesson executives, put them in jail! <laughs> These carrots, put them in soup! <laughs> this group of corgis, put them in tiny boots! <laughs> they should be in boots! <laughs> but that is the big problem here. For companies involved in the opioid crisis, fines just became the cost of doing business. And throughout this crisis, it has been difficult to find any real accountability for the people involved. And there may be no more frustrating example of that than Purdue Pharma, the manufacturer behind OxyContin, the drug that arguably kick-started this crisis. Purdue famously aggressively marketed OxyContin to doctors as a less addictive painkiller that could be used to treat common conditions like backaches and knee pain which was obviously untrue. It would be like using cocaine for a toothache, which, <laughs> incidentally, back in the 1800s, people actually did. <laughs> what an idea that was. My tooth hurt this morning, but I took some medicine, and now I'm really fucking psyched <laughs> about 20 different business ideas. I'm gonna write a screenplay. I know it's the 1800s! <laughs> Purdue. Purdue is owned by members of the Sackler family. Collectively, they're worth an estimated $13 billion, which has enabled them to proudly slap their name on some truly impressive monuments to other people's talent. Uh, the, the Sackler name is on parts of the Met, the Louvre, uh, the Museum of Natural History, the National Gallery in London, the Royal College of Art, an institute at Yale, a library at Oxford, and the Sackler Crossing at the Royal Botanic Gardens. Not bad for a family whose very name sounds like a Hamburglar-like villain that steals <laughs> testicles. Oh, no! <laughs> The Sackler came in the middle of the night and now my penis is shivering. <laughs> the Sacklers love putting their names on things. Although, until very recently, they've been miraculously good at keeping their name off the opioid crisis. But that is now changing with protests like this. In New York City this weekend, protesters flooded the Guggenheim Museum. They dropped fake prescription slips from the upper walkway, angry that the museum takes big donations from the Sackler family, which has been accused of engineering the opioid epidemic. Wow. And look, I know this isn't the point, but just spare a thought there for the Guggenheim janitor who has to clean all that up. <laughs> Dennis didn't take millions from the pharmaceutical industry. Dennis gets $15 an hour and maybe the occasional chance to masturbate on a Cezanne. <laughs> look, look, hey, I didn't say he was a good janitor. I just said you should think about him. <laughs> the reason for this change in public perception is a dawning realisation of just how deeply some of the Sacklers were involved. Because unlike most second-generation heirs to a family fortune, some were very hands-on. Richard Sackler worked at Purdue throughout the crisis, serving as president from 1999 to 2003, and served on the board along with seven other family members. And now, thanks to a number of lawsuits filed by various states, we're getting glimpses of the depth of Richard's involvement. Massachusetts alleges that Richard Sackler at one point demanded to be sent into the field with sales reps on visits to doctors. In fact, his micromanagement was apparently so extreme that Purdue's VP of Sales and Marketing wrote to the CEO, anything you can do to reduce the direct contact of Richard into the organisation <laughs> is appreciated. <laughs> and going by some of his statements, that micromanagement was in service of a pretty clear purpose. According to newly filed court documents, when OxyContin was first released, Richard Sackler, Purdue's former president and son of the company founder, is quoted saying at a company event that the launch would be followed by a blizzard of prescriptions. Amazingly, the full quote is actually worse. He calls it a blizzard of prescriptions that will bury the competition and then goes on to say the blizzard will be so deep, dense and white. And look, as a tagline for Frozen 2, that's pretty good. <laughs> but it's troubling when applied to addictive fucking painkillers. And Richard Sackler's glib tone continued even as Purdue began to see the consequences of the drugs that they were pushing. At the dawn of the opioid epidemic, when 59 deaths were reported in a single state, Purdue's president wrote, quote, this is not too bad. 
could have been far worse. <laughs> wow. That is both callous and also completely besides the point. Because the phrase, it could have been worse, can be applied to literally anything. In fact, one of the only things it cannot apply to is Richard Sackler's statement regarding those 59 deaths. <laughs> and, and, and I have to say, I'm just not sure the full horror of that comment comes across it, it when you just hear a guy read it out on TV. And the problem is, we have to use clips like that, because there are no clips of Richard Sackler. He never does interviews. Even that photo is one of only a small handful we could find. And think of how remarkable that is in and of itself. He's an incredibly rich man. And it's genuinely easier to find multiple image options of birds standing on turtles <laughs> or babies that look like Wallace Shawn. <laughs> And let's, let's all agree, those babies look a lot like Wallace Shawn. <laughs> and this, this invisibility feels deliberate. And, wh and whether it is or not, it has definitely been convenient for Richard Sackler, because it, it's honestly hard to tell the story of his time at Purdue without any video. There is only so long that anyone will listen to someone at a desk reading from court documents. Trust me. <laughs> I know that. I, I'm painfully aware of that. <laughs> So, so tonight we've actually done something unusual. To help you get the emotional impact of Richard Sackler's actual words, we got an actor to play him. So, so let's, let's try that last quote again. Richard Sackler, a, a news article about OxyContin addiction says it's caused 59 deaths in a single state. How do you respond? That's not too bad. <laughs> it could have been far worse. That's right. We got Michael fucking Keaton. <laughs> because... And I'll tell you why. Because... When you're casting for a shadowy heir to a vast fortune who doesn't like to be in the limelight, you go Batman. <laughs> and look, that helps a little bit, right? Here, let, let's try another one. A as evidence mounted that Oxy was causing widespread addiction, Sackler urged the company to publicly blame those who were addicted. Michael Keaton, what did he actually write? We have to hammer on the abusers in every way possible. They are the culprits and the problem. They are reckless criminals. Sackler genuinely wrote that. And not only does that come off as malicious and cold-hearted, it, it also doesn't even make any sense. He's furious at the people who are part of the problem, but the people he's angry at helped make him incredibly rich. You don't see Adam Levine releasing a song condemning horny middle-aged women, because <laughs> that would be hypocritical. Who do you think made you who you are, Adam? <laughs> it's your just dangerous enough for suburban moms to masturbate to energy that got you where you are today. <laughs> Show some respect to your base, son! <laughs> now, now, for legal reasons, I have to tell you, the Sacklers and Purdue insist the family didn't cause the opioid crisis and vigorously deny the claims in the lawsuits that we've mentioned, saying that Richard Sackler's comments have been taken out of context with, quotes, cherry-picked from among tens of millions of other e emails and business documents. But two things about that, cos first, whenever they've added context, it hasn't really helped much. For instance, their explanation for Sackler saying the news of 59 deaths was not too bad was that he was merely commenting about the nature of recent press coverage, which is not better in any meaningful way <laughs> whatsoever. As for that blizzard of prescriptions line, they've claimed the full context for that is that his remarks were an allusion to his delayed arrival at that event due to the well-known blizzard <laughs> of 1996, which, again, in no way exonerates him. Oh, hey, guys, it's not like Richard was recklessly and callously anticipating OxyContin's popularity while it was sunny out. It was snowing. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> and the thing is, for a family that complains about a lack of context, they have fought tirelessly to withhold it, because time and time again, they've settled cases on the condition that evidence will be sealed and unavailable to the public. In fact, a few years back, Purdue settled a lawsuit with Kentucky on the condition that the state AG destroy 17 million pages of documents. 17 million pages! That's an actual blizzard of context that they did not want anyone to see. And you can kind of see why, because just the glimpses of information that we've seen recently resulted in that Guggenheim protest, which in turn led to the museum deciding to stop taking funding from the Sacklers. And the Guggenheim is not the only institution that's cutting ties. The Sacklers and London's National Portrait Gallery have mutually agreed to call off a planned $1.3 million donation. It's true, the National Portrait Gallery bailed on the Sacklers too, and I know that. As punishments go, getting to keep $1.3 million doesn't sound all that fucking bad. <laughs> But keep in mind that these people have infinite money and seem to enjoy nothing more than using it to purchase social status. So, 
not getting to put their name on things may be a real punishment to them. But I would argue that that should only be half of it. The other half is having to put their name on the opioid crisis that they fought so hard to distance themselves from. And that public accounting is starting to become possible, despite the fact that Richard Sackler has barely appeared in public. And there's actually a tantalising development here, because a few weeks ago, the transcript of a video deposition that Richard Sackler gave in that Kentucky case, the case, remember, where 17 million documents were destroyed, leaked to ProPublica and Stat News. This is it, right here. This is the thing that Purdue really did not want anyone to see. And there is some damning stuff in here. The really effective thing would be to see the video of this deposition, but Purdue is fighting ferociously hard to keep it under seal, which benefits them. As you've seen tonight, newscasters reading quotes will only get you so far. But we have the deposition, and you should know, Michael Keaton is not the only actor we got to play Richard Sackler. <laughs> in fact, we got multiple actors to read parts of his deposition word for word. And who better to convey the arrogance of an early exchange uh, about Sackler's involvement in Purdue than someone responsible for playing one of the greatest drug dealers in the, in the history of television? On July 30th of 2014, were you a director of Purdue Pharma, Inc.? Mm, not that I'm aware. This is an affidavit filed in the Southern District of West Virginia and does that appear to be your name? <sighs> that does. And it's dated July 30, 2014. It says, Declaration of Dr. Richard S. Sackler. I am a director of Purdue Pharma, Inc., the general partner of Purdue Pharma, LP. I've held this position since 1990. If that's what it says, then that's what it says. Wow. Richard Sackler came off like a real dick there, right? <laughs> Certainly more so than if I'd just read that to you. And, and since we had Brian Cranston, we didn't stop there, because this deposition also contains an excerpt of a speech that Sackler gave when OxyContin was launched, bragging about how quickly Purdue got the FDA to approve it. So we had him go full Walter White on that one, too. This didn't just happen. It was a deftly coordinated, planned event that took dozens of workers years of effort to succeed. The most demanding new drug approval package for any analgesic product ever submitted didn't languish at the agency. Unlike the years that other filings linger at FDA, this product was approved in 11 months, 14 days. Our previous best approval time for other products was measured in years, not months. God, I felt that in my fucking bones. <laughs> and look, sure, we could have stopped there. Those, those two actors were already incredible, but, but then we remembered, this is HBO. <laughs> and, and if we want someone to read the shit out of another uh, email that Richard Sackler wrote, uh, this one characterising his devotion to OxyContin, we have access to the cast of another iconic drug drama. So brace yourselves, everyone, because Omar coming. You won't believe how committed I am to make Oxycontin a huge success. It is almost that I've dedicated my life to it. Indeed. <laughs> and look, the only problem here is all of these actors are pretty cool, and Richard Sackler decidedly is not. And so to embody the fact that he responded, I don't know, more than a hundred times, during his deposition, we asked Richard Kind to read <laughs> just a selection of them. How much money has Purdue Frederick or Purdue Pharma made off the sale of OxyContin? I don't know. Do you know how much the Sackler family has made off the sale of OxyContin? I don't know. Who's Lydia Johnson? I don't know. 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 How many Purdue entities are there? I don't know. <laughs> Pretty effective, right? And look, Richard Sackler might say, hey, hey, that's not fair. I didn't sound like that. But we don't know if he sounded like that if we can't see the tape, which is why he should absolutely allow it to be released. But if he doesn't, we can only imagine what was going on during his deposition. For instance, maybe he was sloppily eating a turkey sandwich during this actual exchange about OxyContin addiction. Have you made any effort, or as we sit here today, do you know how many patients who took OxyContin in Kentucky became dependent or addicted? No. 
Do you believe that an inappropriate number of patients or an excessive number of patients who took OxyContin in Kentucky became addicted or dependent? No. Do you know or has Purdue made any effort to ascertain how many people who were started on OxyContin wound up becoming dependent and moving on to heroin at some point? No. Why would he eat a sandwich during such a serious deposition? I mean, yes, maybe he didn't, but it would be so easy for Richard Sackler to prove that he didn't. The point is, until he does that, we've uploaded a bunch of videos of four different Richard Sacklers reading extracts from his emails and deposition to sacklergallery.com, which <laughs> I'm sure they'll enjoy. They love having their names on fucking galleries. We've also linked to various state lawsuits at the site so that you can read them for yourself. The point here is, Richard Sackler's deposition should not be something that Purdue gets to bury, like it's buried so many other things over the years. So please, go to the website and watch and use the clips as you see fit. So, if Richard Sackler wanted context, then guess what? This is it. It is a blizzard of context. Deep, dense and white. You're welcome, Sackler fans.